And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico. Of course it is, and it's my great joy to welcome each and every one of you into the Puritan Barn, into the Now You See TV studios for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, we get to look into that great, great special day, the Moedim of God, the Day of Atonement, and it is just with great joy and reverence that we approach this topic, looking forward to that soon coming great celebration. So with that, get ready, because it all starts right now, because we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? I'm John Pounders, and tonight here on the Midnight Ride, I am joining David in the Puritan Barn. I'm excited about it. I hope that you guys are excited, too. This is going to be one of these... Um, one of these topics that really people need to hear right now because a lot of a lot of us grew up in churches or even maybe didn't grow up in a church at all but this was not something that was common to speak of so hopefully you guys are doing well let us know how you're doing in the chat and in the comments and we will be right back after a word from our sponsors many mainstream companies put dangerous chemicals in their products that contribute to disease and disability this is why it's so important that we take care in the products that we consume. The skin is the largest organ in your body and it is the covering to your temple. Our sponsor tonight is Sugar and Spice Soap Company. They create all natural and biblically clean soaps and beauty products. They even have a soap for Midnight Ride listeners. Use coupon code NYSTV to receive 10% off all your purchases. Link in the description. If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger. And nobody ever knows it. How can kids, six, eight, ten years old, be describing rituals that come from a book like the, like the Book of the Dead? It's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil. Thank you guys for joining us. We are back with the Midnight Ride with me, John Pounders, and David Carrico. And David, is I know we've got feasts coming up. We've got Atonement that starts tomorrow night. We also have Sukkot coming up, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. And so this these, these broadcasts that we're doing, this broadcast that we're doing, kind of gets us all set up for something that's really interesting coming up. A lot of people really are unaware of all this stuff, so I'm excited to get in the topic tonight. David, do you have anything that you would like to announce before we get started? Well, tomorrow night on FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live at 8 p.m. Central on our Underground Church YouTube channel, Tracy and Vinay and I will do a presentation called Lost Cities of the Deep. So if you would like to join us for that, uh, you're more than welcome. I think it'd be a blessing to you. Also, a big thank you to all of you that uh, took part in our September prayerathon. We were very pleased with the way that that came turned out. 
Very good, man. Yeah, it's been it's been a really interesting time period. It, it is every fall feast, man. There's always something interesting that happens. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. But man, I'm I'm excited to go through another one this year. This will be I don't know how many years over a decade now of observing the feasts of God, and and there's so much to be said and so much to be taught during these feasts about these feasts, and and it's a shame that the church really hasn't latched onto these instead latched onto pagan holy days um do you got anything you want to say david before we well, start the scripture in daniel seven twenty five. this is the beast agenda um speaking of the beast and he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws and that's what the beast system does it has changed the holy times of god and the so-called professed Christians, instead of doing what the Bible says to do, they do what they, the Bible doesn't say to do, and even what we should not do, because it has all the trappings of idolatry. So it's a blessing to know that there are people that are going to dig in. They're going to say, thus far no more, we are going to observe that which God bid us to, and all that do so are going to see the blessings of God upon their life. And once you start doing it, you're going to have the blessings of God upon you to such an extent no one will be able to get you to quit. And I also, I've observed uh, that during these seasons of the feast, there's an all-out attack from hell. And, and I know, John, we were looking at that um, one year that there are actually satanic groups that do special rituals yeah. against people that observe the feasts of God. And uh, we really need to be aware that this is a time of satanic attack. And uh, we just really have to be be really on our guard at this time. Yeah, there was so many people, too, that have predicted uh, September 23rd is the rapture. And that happens a lot. Actually, I've got a post that I found, I believe it was 2017, from a guy who declaring that the end of the world was going to be on September 23rd. And he's made, I don't know how many false predictions on that, but... Um, this you know he's got 50,000 subscribers there's people that buy into this every year and i like i said i've seen it every year there's always these predictions and and of course it always looks like it's very possible because there's a lot going on in the world i mean it, it really there really is a lot going on so it definitely makes sense that people would think that however i don't believe we're going to be able to pinpoint the exact time period and the exact day uh, just because of a lot of there's a lot of reasons i mean the the fact that most most of us, in fact, probably all of us, don't even understand what the real calendar is. We don't even know the real day for atonement other than what we're, we're, we're coming to find out. There's a lot of different teachings on the calendars. I've observed probably 50 different ones, if not, if not more, and that's not really even exaggerating. That's, that's the fact. And, and David, I'm sure you have too. I don't know how many people have sent us calendar things, say, take a look at this, take a look at this. And, and we did for the longest time, but um, we're in a time period now to where the stars are deceiving us, you know, it talks oh, yeah. about that going on. Oh, so yeah. anything you want to add, David? Well, one good reason not to believe people that predict the day of the Lord's return, what the Lord said in Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. And there was one, uh, bright light wrote a book, 88 reasons why the Lord will return in 1988. And I first read this book in 1994, you know, and, you know, just something real wrong with that. But these, these well, what, guys are... Hold on for a second. What's wrong with it? The fact that you read it or the fact that there's something wrong with the book? <laughs> probably both, you know, probably both. And, you know, uh, these people shouldn't get a minute's worth of our time. You know, they're just, uh, you know, they're just nut whackers. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about it, man. Uh, I, I, I still think it's funny. You read so many books, and I just think it's hilarious to me that you read one that's, you know, talking about 1988, and you read it, you know, over a decade later. I think, I don't know. To me, that's funny. That I, is funny. Yeah, yeah. It is funny. Yeah, it really is, you know. So, anyways, guys, with that being said, we're we're going to get started tonight. And, and before we get started, um, I would like to kind of just explain the feast a little bit so that it kind of gives us a sense of the way things happen in the Bible. It happens in cycles, and you'll see these cycles happen over and over again at least two or three times you see these cycles and so at the very beginning of the year we have passover right this is the first feast and we have these spring feasts that go 
um, couple months. There's like a couple months of feasts. Like they have, there's several feasts that come up. You have Passover, which ultimately Passover originally was in Exodus where the angel of death passed over and the children of Israel would put the blood on the doorpost, saving their lives, saving their children's lives. Um, and so this carried on until Jesus came and Jesus was our Passover sacrifice as well. So it signifies that. So you, you've got salvation basically that comes from this sacrifice that that is brought forth and then you have unleavened bread which represents the burial they're getting rid of the flesh getting rid of the sinly things of this world just completely banishing them so you have a salvation then you have like a sanctification that happens and you have first fruits which is all you know signifies the resurrection it signifies you know they would bring the first fruit offering that was the first fruit that they pulled out of the ground they would offer it to god so that in the fall they would have a healthy harvest and then at passover we're commanded to count 50 50 days uh, and we count 50 days to pentecost this is uh originally this is in the scripture in the new testament this is when the holy spirit came and rested upon mankind right in front of everybody and showed that the temple of God dwells within man for right now. And so you have all of these feasts that set up. So you have your your salvation, you have your um, sanctification, and you have the Spirit of God coming and resting upon you. So you have all of these things setting you up because after that, there's a long spell where there is no feast at all, and it goes all the way through the summer. This period, and, and this is interesting because in our lives, there's a there's a story to tell here. So. You would plant they would plant the grains they would plant the different plants and then all through the summer the it would get rain it would get water it would be growing this entire time and then when the fall came this is when you have the fall feast when the harvest is ready and so you have this time period in our in our lives we all have this time period we have a time period we we are sa we are saved by god because of his blood because of his sacrifice his passover sacrifice we have that salvation from death and then we have the sanctification part where we put away sin. We put it away from our lives and we step away from it because we realize that it brings death. And then we have the, the Holy Spirit who comes and dwells within us. And then we have this long period of growth, this long period of growth and where things start to come into, into the ground and they start to grow up. And then once this fall feast hits, this first feast is trumpets. And I did a little video about trumpets. We've talked a lot about trumpets, but trumpets in the Bible is very clearly tied to prophetic revelations that take place in, in the book of Revelation. It takes place, uh, there's seven angels with seven trumpets. It mirrors the verse in Joshua where the seven priests blow the seven trumpets and take down the wall. There's It's like a war cry and also a watchman's cry uh, because not an atonement which we're going to be talking about today comes up very shortly after just a few days and then you have i think it's five days and you have atonement right after that or, or nine days maybe nine days and you have atonement that comes right after that and when this takes place this is uh, there's also prophetic revelations for atonement there's a lot of stuff in atonement that we're going to be talking about today but i wanted to give you guys a full flavor of what's going on this is why most people believe that in the fall holidays this is when Yeshua, Jesus, will return because this is the time of the harvest. Uh, Jesus said several times in parables that we are like seeds planted. And we are also like the wheat and the tares, the parable of the wheat and tares, showing us that this lines up with exactly how his times are. David called them the Moedim earlier, and that's exactly what they are. The people would call them holidays, but really what they are is the set-apart days of God. Like David said, this is the word in the Hebrew, the Moedim. Uh, they mean they don't mean just a holiday for fun and to observe. They actually mean that God does His works on these time periods in the Scripture. And David, do you want anything to add before we get into atonement? Yeah, and it's hard to resist. And there's an obvious correlation, as you said. We have the Holy War and the in the days of Joshua and uh, the blowing of the trumpets, and then you have the trumpets, the Book of Revelation, the Day of Trumpets. It's such, it's hard not to believe that at some point in time, there's going to be a terrific time of judgment in this time period. And um, this does not enable us to make gross, vain predictions. But at the same time, it makes this time of the year a time for us. It was called a solemn feast. It was called a solemn feast. And it says 
that you were to afflict your souls. And it, it was a time of fasting. It's the only mandated biblical fast under the Old Covenant. So it's a time for serious reflection, and it's a very solemn time. And it's hard to resist the, the idea that one of these cycles of the fall feast, there will be a horrific judgment from God. That's so true. And that, the verse that you've got there, I've got this pulled up. I'm just going to, we'll read it here in Leviticus 23. 26 through 32, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doth any work in that same day, the same soul will be destroyed from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even until even, and shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. And so this is, like David said, this is a solemn time. You know, in and we'll talk a little bit about the prophetic revelations that come along with it later but it is a very solemn time when it talks about the day of the lord in the scriptures um this is what we're talking about here we're talking about a, a solemn day that will come and bring judgment all over the entire world here so let me go here so in leviticus seventeen eleven, it says for the life of the flesh is in the blood and i have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And so we have this, this passage here that's really interesting that talks about the life being in the blood. And I did an entire show on that one time. This was, this was a while back that we talked about this. But in, when you look at the word life, when you look at the word um, life in the, word he, in the Hebrew, here's what it says. You have the word Suke, and I'm not sh sure exactly if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's, it looks right to me. But this is where we get our word psyche. This is where we get our, our human soul, our seed of affections and will, uh, human person, individual. Basically, what makes us alive, what makes us human, what keeps us going is resides within the blood. And all throughout time, the way that the, the way that God set up this whole world was that if you sin you die because your blood ends up dying because you've taken on death on to your body and in order for that death to or that sin to be removed from you there had to be blood sacrifice and it talks a little bit about what they would do in the on in the times of sacrifice here now on the day of atonement it was interesting and, I, and i've got some verses here david that we can you got some that you can pull up and read too which we will but they they had a high priest and the high priest would go inside of the temple. He would make a sacrifice for himself. He would have a scapegoat. He would have all of these different things. And he would have to make a sacrifice for himself. And he would also have to make a sacrifice for the people before the people were even allowed to enter the tent. Um, and this is represented in, in what we what we said here. Now, there was, a, there was a time period before this that I think we should talk about, David, that I think um, something that you've, discussed quite a bit we did an entire episode on strange fire because there's a lot of a lot of that going on nowadays but this strange fire that the sons of Aaron came and offered in the holy room in the holy place um, caused them to die and caused them to be consumed by fire and David do you want to talk a little bit about that because I know this is something that you've uh, talked about in a previous show that we had that I think was really interesting yeah, we could look at the scripture in Leviticus, the ninth chapter and beginning in the 23rd verse. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. Can you imagine God's glory, his kabod, which is literally, it means a weighty presence. They could see it, for goodness sake. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. Well, I guess so. 
And when the offering was made in a proper way, and when proper reverence was given to the presence of God, the fire of God consumed that offering. What a unbelievable, well, it's not unbelievable, we believe it, but it's just, just really off the hook, isn't it? Now, let's just read on now. In, in the 10th chapter, it says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded not. Now, in the offering, the fire had to come from the brazen altar. But Nadab and Abihu had been at a pagan altar, and they had brought fire from a pagan altar, and they offered it, and it was strange fire. And we'll see the results here immediately. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them. Now, we don't want to miss that this is the same fire in chapter 9 and verse 24, the fire that consumed the proper offering, this is the same fire that burned Nadab and Abihu to a Christ, mixing the things of paganism with the things of God. God is not putting things up for a vote here. When he has the way that we are to approach him, we have to approach him in a holy reverence in a way that, that he lays out. And in the third verse, it says, Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And uh, they carried them out of the camp, and they were struck dead. And what a lesson here to reverence the presence of God and not to mix the things of paganism in with the things of God, because there will surely be a time when all that offer strange fire, though they be not struck dead instantly, there will be that time that fire will consume you just like it did Nadab and Abihu. You know, it, it reminds me of an Acts when, when, um, who was it that was Ananias and Sapphira? Ananias and Sapphira. That's an interesting correlation. Oh yeah, there. yeah. That that's an interesting correlation. Also, I I think it was uh, John MacArthur that did the Strange Fire um, conference that was speaking of, and I and I'm not advocating for John MacArthur. He seemed to have gotten a little bit more closer to what we believe in this final in his last days. You know, that he's gotten older, he seemed to be taking a pretty good stand, a stand against sin, but he talked about the strange fire um, consuming the, uh, I would say, the charismatic Pentecostal movement. Where, and, and it's kind of interesting because if you think about it, if if where they're receiving their spiritual presence, their gifts are not from the Holy Spirit, then where are they receiving the spiritual gifts? Because the Spirit also is relatable to fire. The Holy Spirit's relatable to fire as well. What do you think about that, David? Well, I remember we did a midnight ride on those bizarre, really crazy things that yeah. are put forth, um, the grave sucking yeah. and, uh, uh, yeah, you know, it, it is just debauchery. Yeah. The, these things. And, you know, I, I know we believe in the gifts of the spirit. We believe they're real, but we also believe one of the biggest hindrances to people receiving the genuine gifts of the spirit is the strange fire that has permeated and I think Mr. MacArthur, he, he, very good job pointing out a lot of it out. And he and he goes so far, he throws the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. And I can understand why. A lot of people are like that when they see this strange, strange fire that has taken over. And so many, we could give endless examples. Mr. Copeland, they're acting like he's cutting his wrist to put his blood into the communion cup, putting the Jesuit pulp up on the big screen. We could, we could go for hours on these bizarre examples, but there's going to be a payday. There's going to be a payday for all of those that mingle the strange fire. And one of the biggest ways that the inculcation of paganism is coming into the professed Christian church is through the pagan holidays. There's just no doubt about that. The times and laws have been changed, and people are submitting themselves to the bramble of this beast system. Yeah, man, it's, it's unfortunate, too, because people aren't testing these spirits, testing to see if these are really of God, seeing if these people are really of God. And it 
it's really hard to test people, I guess, when you only hear what they have to say. It's really hard to know if they're actually legitimately doing something for God or not. Sometimes, you know, the people don't necessarily understand what's going on, but uh, just like the children of Israel didn't really understand what was going on with the two priests. They just know they ended up dead, <laughs> and it yeah. was kind of the end for them. Yeah. So, so you might be asking yourself, all of you people out there listening, how can I celebrate atonement? And if there's anything you want to add before I talk about that, David, I, I feel free because I know we've uh, there's plenty more that could be said about atonement. I mean, there's so many different things that they've um, that that tie into other things, and we'll be talk more about the prophetic stuff and the Azazel stuff as well after this part. But if there's anything else you'd like to add before. I talk a little bit about how we can celebrate it today and why, what the importance of that is. Well, go right ahead. I'll weigh in after that. Go right ahead, John. Okay. So if you're asking yourself, how do I celebrate this? Obviously, there is no temple. Obviously, there is no man high priest, which is exactly what the New Testament talks about in the book of Hebrews. It's really interesting the way that it lines everything out in such a great way for us to kind of understand how these things work. I think without the book of Hebrews and being able to see some of these things kind of showing us how that Jesus fulfilled this feast and will fulfill it in latter times as well, this is, um, there's nothing better than some of these verses. So Hebrews 10 verse 1, and this explains it to us pretty well. It says, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the uh, comers thereunto perfect. So this is speaking directly about the atonement, because year by year they would come. They would only go once a year into the Holy of Holies, the, the priests would. Only one time, the high priest is the only one that could go in there, and only do it once a year. He had to put on a specific outfit that was only worn one time a year. He had to do all of these different things. But this says that this was only a shadow. It was a shadow of the good things to come and in not the very image of these things. This was something that is just basically God showing himself who he is, showing himself how serious it is for sin and show, giving the people a chance to actually be redeemed from sin, right? This is this the problem was and the book of Hebrews goes on about it that the the actual priests were not perfect. And Hebrews 10:11 through 14 it says, "And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for the sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expect, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. So this one says, for by one offering, by offer, him offering himself, not only was his blood good enough for him to enter and stand at the right hand of God, but it was also good for every single person to be sanctified and set apart through his sacrifice. And in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now in ancient times, and the, we can, if David, if you know the verse on this, then feel free to pull it up. But if not, I can kind of explain it here. But what in, in ancient times before Jesus, the high priest would have to go in and make the sacrifices before the people could come in to the altar of grace. They couldn't even come inside because if they did, they would be, they would be dead because they weren't holy enough to even enter into the tent and enter into this but this says that we have a high priest who cannot be touched uh, with the feelings of our infirmities he was all in all points tempted with us with sin he's right there at the right hand of god and so that we can actually because of this we don't have to wait every year to do this we can approach boldly to the throne offering up our you know ideas of you know, God, forgive us, forgive us for the things that we've done, forgive us for the things that we did that we didn't know, the things that we acted out in pride, the things that we just acted out because we're selfish. Forgive us for these things because sometimes sin, sin isn't necessarily always something that you're just like, hmm, should I steal this or should I not? It's not always like that. Sometimes our pride wells up inside of us to where we don't even see the sin that we have in our life. And atonement has always been for me 
uh, David and everybody listening, it's always been a time where God just happens to show me. He starts showing me the things that really are down and, and crappy about me, the things that really uh, maybe irritate him about me and irritate myself about me. And I see those things, and it's really a time that we need to be sitting up um, ourselves to accept the sacrifice, being able to redeem, be, have redemption, and to repent from all of these things. This is the heart of this entire feast is to be able to um, set ourselves up in that way. And um, one more verse in Hebrews before I get into the kind of the prophetic revelation. Actually, David, if you have anything you want to add before I get into the kind of the prophetic revelation in the book of Hebrews about that. Well, um, in uh, Leviticus 23, 27, which is much like the text in 16, it says uh, also on the 10th day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And what I always say and what I try to do is whenever there is a, and we know, of course, we don't have to make that offering by fire. Christ is our offering. But whenever there's a precept in the law that we can apply to ourselves, will be blessed and those precepts and those moral statutes they're they're eternal and applying this as a day where we do fast and where we do afflict our souls it's not time for happy church it's not time for uh you know it's time for that it's time for reflection and it's time for repentance and this is the way that if we will do that, and it is a great day to join in and fast with the Lord, this is this is the spirit of the Day of Atonement. It's a solemn, uh, it's a solemn. And in First Corinthians five and seven, Paul said, "Purge out therefore the old leaven," and the old leaven is the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, as was taught by our Lord, that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Then in verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast. <laughs> therefore let us keep the feast. Yeah. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And I think about that. what are the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now in Judaism, they teach the ten days of awe. And it's kind of like uh, what your days of repentance and repentance is a good thing. But if you don't know Jesus, you know, that's where you begin repenting and believing the gospel. But it's kind of like a New Year's resolution. It's good that you made a New Year's resolution, I guess, if you keep it. But that's just superstition. It's the heart that changes. And repentance is a way of life. This is the biblical doctrine of repentance it's an everyday thing and while there is a day of atonement for deep repentance the the true doctrine of repentance and I, i'll read something from john wesley on repentance of believers his sermon and uh he says that um uh, notwithstanding this there is also a, a repentance and a faith taking the words in another sense, a sense not quite the same, nor yet entirely different, which are requisite after we have believed the gospel. Yea, and in every sub subsequent stage of our Christian course, we cannot run the race which is set before us. And this repentance and faith are full as necessary in order to our continuance and growth in grace as the former faith and repentance were in order to our entering into the kingdom of God. And like John said, this is a time to let the, uh, the Spirit of God show us uh, those deep-rooted things that we need to root out. And uh, as Brother Wesley said, he said, sin doesn't reign, but it does remain in the best of us. And we need to constantly uh, be repentant, and letting the Spirit of God cleanse and break up those strongholds within our lives. Yeah, yeah definitely, David. And, you know, there's a, a verse that reminds me of this, you know, because it talks about us, you know, if we have any ought with our brother or anything like that, you know, before we even go 
and approach the throne to, to kind of just at least forgive, you know, be able to move past all those things. But there's also this one scripture, it's, a, it's actually Jesus talking, and he's talking about a, a guy that comes to comes up to the altar, he comes up to the temple, and he can't even look towards God. He can't even look towards God. He beats, beats upon his chest, saying, God, please forgive me, this sinner. And then there's the Pharisees who are standing up there, the religious people, and they say, God, thank God I'm not like all these people that I have to do this. And he tells us that the guy that came in humility there, the guy that he came in humility was the one who was forgiven. And oftentimes people think, oh, I have nothing, you know, God, I've done everything, God's good, he does his stuff. But if we really face who we are as people, we really face that we do have selfishness, we do have pride, we do have all of these things, then it can be a time of just complete learning. Uh, because this is this is really important to know because in the end times, and I believe this is talking about this here when I when I read this, I'm gonna kind of give you guys a a thought on this, the kind of the in my idea, the final atonement, the final day of atonement. And I want to read from the passage of Hebrews first and nine, twenty six through twenty eight. It says for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice himself. So it says he appears at the end of the world. And it says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So the first time he appeared, and he took bore the sins of the world. And this second time he appears, he's coming unto salvation. And in Revelation here in, in uh, 21, 12 through 15, I believe this is, this is kind of the final showdown right here. This is when he is able to sanctify those that are to be sanctified and those that are not are to be cast into the fire. And so we're going to read about this. And it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and or death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so we have this scenario where um, Jesus has returned. It talks about Matthew how he separates the sheep from the goats, and he goes through and he talks about all these things he talks about you know the people that helped him the people that did all these things we these were the ones that were his sheep and in revelation 21 let's see here Re revelation 21 verses 25 through 27 it says and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day for there should be no night there and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it and there shall in no wise enter anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so we have a scenario where Jesus has returned. The final trumpet has happened. All these things take place. You have is you have a very interesting time because the only time that you hear of the Lord's wrath being poured out is on the sixth seal and on the seventh trumpet. You have this wrath of God being poured out on the earth so bad that it causes the rich men of the world, the the kings, to beg. God, beg God to let the rocks fall down on them. This is a great and powerful day. In Zephaniah, it talks about the day of the Lord. And David, if you want to pull up that verse here in a minute and read some from Zephaniah about it, about the day of the Lord, but this day of the Lord is coming and it's coming with fury. And the point of this day of the Lord, this atonement, this last final atonement is so that those who are worthy, those who have accepted the sacrifice of the high priest, can now enter the holy city. They can now enter the holy city because in Re in um, Revelation 21, it says that no wise anything will enter into the defileth, neither whatsoever worketh an abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So it's not he's not going to let anybody in it that do, the, do these things. He's not going to let anybody in it that aren't cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, that don't have the atonement sacrifice ready for them to enter into the this system. And I think that um, a lot of times, you know, people think, well, I can't wait for the day of the Lord. You know, people, I've even heard songs about the day, the day of the Lord. We can't wait for the day of the Lord. But even if we are sitting there with our Messiah and we are standing there when the great white throne is rolled out, 
we're all going to be silent. We're all we're not going to be out there speaking and you know praising God for these wicked people that went away. We're going to be silent. You're right. This is going to be a time of um, great mourning for uh, a lot of people. A lot of people. And I don't and I don't want to overstate what I know because I really don't know for sure. You know, maybe we will be rejoicing that all the wicked are gone at that point. Maybe we will, but we're going to be facing the great white throne as well. All of us are going to be facing it. And it's a, that's why it's such a solemn time, because this is a time where you you better get get your heart right. We better get ourselves right in all of this, because this is the this is the final thing. And after that, the next feast that comes along is Sukkot and that's Feast of Tabernacles. And right after I think it's five days after atonement, we have this time period where we are dwelling. The, the idea is dwelling that, this, you know, we're dwelling with God and we're tabernacling with God in the new Jerusalem, which is awesome. This is an, it's an awesome, exciting time period. Sukkot is, is a great time period. And, but atonement, this is the day that it's not going to go so great for a lot of people. And uh, David, you want to add that Zephaniah or anything else you want to add to go for it? In Zephaniah, the first chapter in the 14th verse, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. This is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Seek ye the Lord all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Mm. Very, 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 very solemn time. You know, it's, it's one of those, one of these time periods when one day, one day, this is all going to happen. This is all going to take place. And this is why when the trumpets sound, it's time to get your heart right. It's time to get your heart right right now because when that day comes, it'll come like a thief in the night. It's going to come quickly. It's going to come so quickly that nobody's going to have time for it. You know, one of the most disturbing dreams I ever had, David, this was before I was a Christian, was a dream that I was laying in my bed and I, I didn't know it was a dream. It felt so real because I was laying in my bed and I woke up to sounds of explosions and it looked like the sky was just on fire it was just crazy like havoc like you never never would believe it to be and it was just so frightening and i remember all i could think of was the book of revelation i got to read the bible i got to see what's happening and i went to pick up the book and by the time i went to pick it up i heard the voice say it's too late and so in my dream it, it frightened me so much that the day of the lord might come without me ever being able to get ready for it. And that frightened me to my core for I don't know how long before I actually ended up uh, repenting and turning to God. But it frightened me. And it should frighten us all. It should frighten us all because we will give account for what we've done. We will stand before God for what we've done. And thankfully, the blood of the Lamb is a worthy sacrifice for us. Thankfully, the atonement is a worthy way for us to be able to enter into the new Jerusalem. And it, because without it, none of us would make it. I know a lot of people think they've never done anything wrong or they think they're God's gift to mankind, but let's face it. We're all rotten people in our own way. We all have our own selfishness. We all have our own pride. We all have something that is not, does not sit pretty before God. And so being humble enough to accept that being humble enough to accept his sacrifice and being joyous enough to accept it, you know, knowing that this is really, the only option that we have, I mean, think about it for the Jews. They don't have the Day of Atonement anymore. They don't even have a temple anymore to be able to do the Day of Atonement. They don't have any any way to do any of these things. So for years, they've gone without any atonement sacrifice because they, fail, they failed to accept the true atonement for their sins. And so we should be thankful, but we should also be very um, solemn about it and knowing that this is this is a time period that 
uh, we should afflict ourselves. David said something about fasting. I believe the same thing. You know, we are we are the temple now. So, you know, by fasting, by spending that day doing the things that matter, like repenting and spending our time in prayer and, and doing stuff like that is very reasonable, I believe. I believe it's super reasonable for people to do. A lot of people think, well, that's just putting yourself under bondage. But really what it is is the fear of the Lord. It's the fear of God knowing that his wrath could come upon any of us and there's nothing that we could do about it. Uh, the fear, the fear of God, knowing that he could snatch our souls away from our body. This is what drives us to do it. The fear of God. Also the thankfulness, thankfulness for what he's done for us. And David, do you have anything to add before we talk about the scapegoat a little bit? Yeah. Uh, the, the text you read in Hebrews nine twenty eight really stood out to me. It, uh, said when, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And, you know, we all need to ask ourselves, are we looking for him? And are you looking for him to appear? You know, Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye will see him. Are you looking for him to appear for this great solemn day of the Lord? And, of course, this has been replaced in the mindset of modern professed Christians with this secret rapture concept. It's not going to be a secret. He's going to appear. Are you looking for him to appear? And in Matthew uh, chapter 24, verse 27, Jesus said, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And Christians today that are schooled in dispensationalism don't believe they're going to be at the great white throne. They believe they're going to be just judged for rewards, nothing bad. Well, let me tell you what. We need to look for the appearing of the Lord, and we need to get it in the depth of our heart that this day of the Lord isn't some funny time, uh, playtime game. It is solemn, and this is what that day of atonement re represents. It's that solemn reckoning, and it's preparing for that solemn reckoning that's going to come on the real day of the Lord. We need to look for him to appear, not believe in some kind of uh, John Darby's fairy tale. Amen. That's so true, man. It, and it, it, there's no whitewashing this stuff. I mean, a lot of people just like to whitewash the idea that God's just going to look over our sins without, without any of this, that there's no hell, none of these things. But the fact is that, man, we're going to stand before a just God who's going to give us our just rewards. And that there's no greater reason than to accept that sacrifice because, man, if you don't, you're in trouble. You're in, there's no, nobody on here that can comment on this chat or on the comments that can say, I've been sinless my whole life. There's no way that anybody can comment that. So with that being said, let's get into a little bit of something that I'm sure that a lot of people are or should, should be interested in, I think, is... Um, this is one of the most interesting aspects of it, in my opinion. So we have the scapegoat. And according to the Bible, the priest would cast lots for two goats. And one was a lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. And in, in the thing that makes it the interesting, interesting, the word scapegoat there is Azazel, uh, which is a character in the book of Enoch, actually one of the, the head watchers that's in the book of Enoch. It says in Enoch 10.8, and the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel to him, ascribe all sin. And so, David, I want to hand this one over to you because you you did a really good show on Azazel one time, a really fantastic show. And I believe it was called just Azazel the Scapegoat. I'm not 100% sure, but um, really interesting. It had uh, Azazel, um, the thumbnail has an uh, angel in chains. And so, David, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and the thing that we don't want to miss here is that when Jesus died upon the cross, that he absolutely defeated every dark principality and power. In the book of Colossians, chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And Azazel represents the power of the fallen watchers, and the Day of Atonement represents the defeat of all the powers of hell, 
all the powers of the the Nephilim agenda that Satan wants to implement upon the earth. And there's two goats on the Day of Atonement. And the Leviticus 16, 15, it says, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. The atonement represents forgiveness of sin. Thank God that Christ would fulfill as the lamb that took away the sin of the world. And then in verse 21 and 22, it says, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. And they would send the goat away into the wilderness. So we have goat number one is for sin. Goat number two is for iniquity. And iniquity are those things. It's actually in the Hebrew, it's the word avon, like ding dong, avon. And it means not just the sinful act. Hitting someone in the nose is an act of sin. But the thing within your heart that made you do that, that's the iniquity. Sin is the outward expression of iniquity in our heart. There's that old song, Rock of Ages, Clef for Me. And there's a line in it that is little understood anymore. But it goes B for sin, the double cure, boom, boom, sin iniquity. And we have to understand that on the Day of Atonement, there it represents all that we need fulfilled in Christ, dealing with sin, dealing with iniquity. And to properly understand this, this the two goats on the Day of Atonement, they're prefigured in the work of Christ as salvation and the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the cleansing from sin. And, to you know, we talk a little bit about the strange fire. And I believe that the great thing that got the Pentecostal movement off track is when they did away with the aspect of cleansing from sin as the main focus of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And I'll read a text for you in the book of Acts in the 15th chapter and the ninth verse. And the text says here, and the apostle Paul at the council of Jerusalem, or Peter, excuse me, is reflecting back on what happened in the 10th chapter of Acts when Cornelius the Gentile was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he said in verse 9, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. By faith, our hearts are purified when we allow the Holy Spirit to do that deep work in cleansing sin. And the second work of grace takes place just like the first one. We believe God for salvation, and we also believe God for that deeper work of cleansing from sin. And this is what was prophesied by John the Baptist in Luke, the third chapter, and the, the 16th and 17th verse. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And that fire is there to purify your hearts. And when we come for that believing God, for that infilling of the Spirit, to cleanse from sin, don't, don't worry about thinking about tongues. Don't worry about thinking about anything. But believe God for the fire of God to cleanse what you commit unto him. And in verse 17, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into the garner, but the shaft he will burn with, uh, with fire unquenchable. And when they would separate the shaft from the wheat, they would throw it up in the air and they would fan it to blow it out. And that's what the Holy Spirit baptism does. The Lord is there with his fan to blow out of us those things that, uh, yeah, and you know, you, you can't get them out until you get the fork. You got to throw it up in the air. You got to break up your fallow ground and allow the Lord to fan those things out of her life. This is the double cure. These are the two gates, goats of the Day of Atonement. And that great Day of Atonement, this is a time for us to come back and to um, 
push the plate back a little bit to get serious with God and uh, see what he would do in our life. What, and he will certainly cleanse that which we commit unto him. That's so true. And, you know, some, a question that, I, uh, that I've, we've gotten a lot when it has to do with this and the Azazel aspect of it is how does Azazel fit into the end time scenario? How does he fit into the end of the world? Because obviously he has some kind of tie in with that. So what would you say his aspect of end of the world has to do with? Well, we've taught and we've talked this in our book of Enoch commentary, and it says specifically in the book of Enoch and they shall return. And it's spoken of in connection with gathering the the people in Iran and there in the the Medes and the Persians into the last days invasion of Israel. But in the book of Enoch, it speaks about their release. And I believe there's another passage here that in the book of Revelation that I believe connects with that. And it's in the Revelation, the eighth chapter, and it speaks here of uh, in the first verse, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. And in the book of Daniel, it talks about how Michael will stand up. And that word in the Hebrew is the word amad. And it means to stand up and be still. And it's like there's such a solemn thing here that the the angels, there's there's that war in heaven, then all of a sudden the the angels of God stand down and then that trumpet blows and then it says the seven angels which stood before God to them were given seven trumpets and in this huge moment of silence when the angels of God no longer resist and Satan comes back in to our, to the first heaven and the trumpets of God blow this is the removal of the strainer this will be certainly a most solemn time and uh i you know and i i just feel that you know this could be upon us you know just literally imminently yeah i think so um, and you know you talked about in one of the episodes the judgment of the watchers to where the angels will drag them off um into the, into darkness and and it reminds me there's a correlation here with the azazel ritual that is also in book of enoch that i just noticed kind of today because in the book of Enoch, you have the archangel dragging Azazel away to be chained up. In the ritual, scapegoat ritual in the Bible, you have a, what they call a fit man, a fit man of some sort because he walked and took the, took the goat way off into the wilderness. And you have a similar scenario, kind of a, a shadow of that right there. And so uh, when, you have, when you have this, um, what, what is the scripture, I guess, in Enoch, David? You, we did a whole show about this in our Book of Enoch video commentary, but about the angels being drug off by these, the fallen angels being drug off by the archangels. Yeah, and we actually related this to the story of Prometheus, which is basically a parody of this scene in the Book of Enoch. And the judgment of these fallen watchers was so horrific that the good angels were even squeamish. It yeah. even scared them. They were even reluctant until the, they finally realized the resolve of the Lord, and then they executed the judgment on these fallen ones. But the judgment was so horrific that, um, it, you know, it even made the good angels reluctant to inflict it until they were finally admonished by the Lord. And it's uh, the whole thing is just so solemn and just so um it, it just like john said it takes us back to the understanding that hell's real hell's real salvation is real and uh the the salvation that is separated from repentance is a no salvation at all it's a modern gospel but for all that will repent and believe the gospel and follow the lord out of a heart of faith there is salvation and once we're saved, we're going to become dissatisfied with ourselves. We're going to understand that though uh, sin does not reign, it does remain. And we will be going on that sanctification to allow the Lord to get those things out of our life. And this is certainly the whole theme of the Day of Atonement 
It is this solemn time, and it's, it's a solemn time that gives us joy in the mighty power of God, how that God is stronger than all the devils of hell uh, over Azazel and all of his minions, and he defeated him the first time. And in this last time, when we're going to see some unbelievable things transpire on this earth, that the Lord is all that we need because he is the victor and he is all powerful when we trust and walk in just humble obedience unto him. Man, that's so, so well said. And I think that, you know, I feel led to just say this too, you know, if, if you have lived your life and you are ready for renewal, you are ready for that chance to be forgiven, that chance to be set free. Know this, that, it can happen for you. It happened for me. And I, I know some of you know this about me. Some of you don't, but there was a time when I was highly addicted to drugs. Um, also just everything that came along with that. I was dealing drugs and I was also involved criminally in different things. And there came a point in my life where I realized that everything that I had done to get me to where I was, where I was, was all my fault. 100%. It was my fault. I made the decisions. I chose to do what I wanted to do and do the things that I thought were right because of my pride. I thought I knew everything. And it landed me in a horrifying situation where I was, you know, almost dying from overdose or not overdose. I'm sorry, but, um, coming off of the drugs, just going through, um, that process. I mean, of drugs that you sure you're not supposed to just stop taking, you know, pharmaceutical drugs as well. And, um, in that moment, I realized that my way was wrong and I had no other way, no other thoughts, no other ideas on how am I going to change this? How, cause I had tried to change myself so many times. I tried to quit drugs. I tried to quit being the person that I was being, but it was a, a fail, failed cause because I really didn't have any reason, any, any hope that you might, you might want in order to do something like that. And in, in that time period, I remembered, you know, all the things that when I was younger, you know, Jesus can save you. Jesus can put away your sins. Jesus can remove your sins from you. He can lift you up when you're down. He can do all these things. And I started to remember all that stuff going on in my head. And in that time period, man, I, I just cried out to God. I said, God, and I was laying in the floor of a, a jail cell. And I said, God, if you care about me at all, please just let me know you care about me. And I will, I will serve you forever. I just want to know you know, that you're real and that you care about me because I want your way. I'm tired of my own way. And I was ready at that point to give up my own way. And if you're ready to give up your own way, if your own way has brought you heartache, brought you pain, if your own way is full of pride and arrogance, it's time to put it, do God's way. And that's what I said. And, you know, shortly after that, he brought somebody in that came up out of their bread. God told him to come pray for me. And it just, it really showed me that God did care, showed me that God was they're looking out for me this entire time. And, and I, and I ask you guys, if you're looking in that position, pray, ask God to save you, ask God to come and change your life and ask him to do it. He will do it. You have to be faithful in, in the willingness to be able to uh, go to him and be, be humble enough to even seek him. Because oftentimes we get in this mode where we think we know everything. And, and I'm sorry, people, none of you out there, not one of us, not me, not Matt David, none of us know everything. None of us know, uh, very much at all really in the whole scheme of things if you really think about how much information there is out there there we've know very little um but what we do what we do know is that salvation comes through the messiah that his blood can change you it can change who you are his life because his blood you're taking on his blood the life is in the blood you're taking on his blood onto you and it changes who you are and i'm telling you that if it can happen with me and there are thousands of other people that we've talked to that have done the same thing. You can do it as well. And it's time to do it now. There's no waiting. You can't wait. When the time comes and if you don't die first, because we're all going to die, there's going to be a point when you die and you probably won't expect it. It'd probably be one of those things that just happens. And some people get to go their whole life and die and they know they're dying and they're, they get to go and say a last word or whatever. But most of us never get that opportunity. And even, even if you don't die, the end, day of the Lord could come at any moment. It comes like a thief in the night. And so now's the time to do that. Don't wait and do, do it with a real heart of change. Don't do it just because of fire insurance. Do it because you really know that you've messed up. He came for the sinners. He came for the sick. The healthy don't need a doctor, right? But the sick need a doctor. And you got to know that you're sick because pride will keep you telling you that you do know what's best. Pride will keep you, keep you right in that area to where you're going to keep stumbling and keep stumbling and keep stumbling. So it's time to be humble 
Uh, and David told me it's a great day for that and a great, great time for that. David, you got anything you want to add, David, before we end this? I don't know what I could add to that except just turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus now with all of your heart and uh, to him that cometh to him, he'll no wise cast out. His arms are open and that great day of atonement has made atonement for each and every one of us. So we're so thankful for Christ's death upon the cross as that ultimate fulfillment of the day of atonement. Amen to that, David. And so with that being said, we're going to do this thing we call the pounder's pound. And it's where you just take your mouse or your phone and you just pound that like button with all your might. We do it all together on the count of three. Some of you guys have already hit the like button. I see that. But those of you that have not done it yet, let's do it together. Let's do it together. Let's make waves. And, and I want you guys to know this too. I do. We do not put ads on our videos. We are not monetized on here. And so if you see ads on here, we're not getting paid for them. Feel free to skip the fire out of those things. Just pound the fire out of the skip ad button. But just letting you guys know, because they've been putting crazy ads on our videos. Some videos have like 20 ads that just keep popping up, and we're not getting paid a penny for it. They're just throwing it up on our videos. So just want to make you guys aware of that in case you're sitting there watching the ads thinking, oh, I'm supporting now you see TV watching the ads. And I'll skip those things. Skip them, skip them as quick as you can. So, David, count us down. One, two, two three. three. Boom. I could hear it all over the place, guys. Thank you guys for that. Um, David, you want to end us out? Let's do it. And I just say, if you do want to support Now You See TV, you could subscribe to the subscription network, Book of Enoch Commentary, or you could buy the coolest coffee cup in the world. Look at that. Look <laughs> at yeah. that. The Heck. coolest coffee cup on this good old flat earth right there. Let me tell you what now. I think I recognize those people. Yeah, who are there. those guys? If you yeah, guys look real closely, that's, that's actually me and David on there. How cool is that? Yeah. That, thanks, Adam, for that artwork, by the way. That's really cool. But in all seriousness, we do appreciate each and every one of you that uh, your hearts are yoked with ours in that vision that the Lord has given us. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. We couldn't do what we do without you. So with that... Until next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Rise up.